Take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. John, chapter 11. It's good to see everyone here this morning and glad that you've come to worship with us this morning on this Easter Sunday. Over the last several weeks, we have been working as a church through the Gospel of John looking at what we call the I am statements. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus takes and he uses a a very particular pattern of speech. He will say, I am, and then he will give us a, a character trait about himself. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. And that is a very interesting phrase because what he's doing is taking the words I am and and he's referring back to an Old Testament passage. Back in Exodus when God revealed himself to Moses, he used the name I am to tell uh, Moses who he was. And it is a reference to God's sovereignty. It is a reference to God's uh, self-existence. Jesus is saying when he says, I am, he is referring to himself as God. In fact, as you read the Gospel of John, you realize that that was one of the major reasons why the Jewish authorities wanted to crucify him was because they felt like he had blasphemed against God. Now, we have looked at all of those up till here, and today I want to bring in the last one. In John chapter 11 verse 25 and 26, I want you to notice what Jesus says here. Jesus said to her, that is to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. And then he raises a question, do you believe this? This statement serves in many ways as a cornerstone of our faith. The reason we can have hope in the midst of life's trials and life's difficulties is because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And of course, the greatest demonstration of that is that on Good Friday, he laid his life down and on Sunday morning, he picked it back up is a reminder to us that this truth anchors our souls. As the guys were sitting there and they were singing, I was thinking back, I I love that song, guys. I appreciate you singing that for me. Um, and, And not singing it for me. You didn't sing it for me. You sang it for Jesus, but I'm glad you picked that song. I've been hearing that song over and over. I it got me thinking about my dad a little bit. I can remember the first time on an Easter Sunday my family ever went to church. Cliff, I had a light blue leisure suit that I wore. I was about 10 years old. Man, I was proud of that thing. Man. And then I was thinking about all the times that we gathered together to celebrate. And I love the fact that even though he has been gone for many, many, many years, I know where he's at on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, I know that in the midst of life's trials and life's sorrows, there is an anchor that holds my soul. Jesus rose again. He is the resurrection and the life. So as we come in here this morning, I really want to ask you a question. We're going to work our way all the way through this chapter, but I want to ask you a simple question this morning. Have you ever found yourself waiting on God's timing. God's timing never works the way we think it should, does it? It, He never works exactly when we think he should work. Sometimes he takes longer, sometimes he acts sooner. But we have to wait on God's timing. In this passage, we are going to see that. And we're going to find a way to, to maintain our hope in the midst of difficult times. And so what I want to do is I want to go back to verse 1 here, and I just want us to work our way through this text for a moment. And I want to show you three things here. And I hope that these, when you leave here this morning, of all the things you do on Easter Sunday, I hope you'll remember these points. I, I want to encourage you to write them down. The first thing I want you to notice is that God's love is never late. 
Amen? God's love is never late. We'll be late for everything. We have staff meetings on Monday morning. Uh, we, we, we meet at 9 a.m. We start the meeting at 9.30 a.m. Clarissa, do you want to tell them why? It's not because of Clarissa. Anybody on the staff want to raise their hand? All right, it's because Cliff is late. But God's love is never late. It may feel like it sometimes. It's never late, but it's always timed to perfection. Notice what happens in, in John chapter 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I want us to think for a moment about this relationship between Jesus and this family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, because it's very important. Now, we know Mary and Martha just a little bit. We have seen her in the Gospels in other places. For instance, back in Luke chapter 10, the Bible tells us that there was a time when Jesus had come to the home of these two ladies, and he'd come there, it looks like, or at least appears, for dinner. And something very interesting happens there. Martha is kind of the very practical, very kind of active. Uh, some people have called her a busybody. I don't think she should. I think she was just a good host. And she's running around and she's taking care and, and she's making stuff. And this morning I, I woke up and I heard all this banging and clanging going on in our kitchen. And, and it was Grace in there and she was putting some things in the oven and getting ready to cook and, 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 and banging around. She was busy serving us so we could have dinner when we come home from church this afternoon. That's Martha. Very active. She, she's serving Jesus. Mary, however, is kneeling at his feet, listening to his teaching. And in fact, Mary kind of gets, or Martha kind of gets irritated by this, but Jesus reminds her it's okay. This is the two women. Now, by the way, let me make something about that. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, are you a Mary or are you a Martha? And sometimes you'll hear, you know, some, some people say, well, if, if you're busy about the work of, of the church you're doing right, you're a Martha, and, and that's the way you ought to be. And, and other people say, no, you ought to be a Mary, you ought to be more contemplative. Can I say this to you? You ought to be both. There is a time and a place for both things. Those are the two sisters. Lazarus, however, we don't really know a lot about Lazarus. Let, let me tell you the biblical facts on Lazarus real quick. We know he's the, mother, the brother of Mary and Martha. We know he lived in Bethany, uh, which is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. We know that he was dearly loved by Jesus, that he gets sick and died, and without giving the rest of the story away, Jesus rose him again. And that resurrection is amazing, but it put him on the radar of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they started to try to kill him. That's what we know about Lazarus. I want us to zoom in and focus on that phrase in verse 3. I mentioned it just a moment ago. So the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. That's all I had to say. He whom you love is ill. That is reminding us something about Jesus and his relationship with Lazarus. I find it interesting that John includes that because John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I don't think that was a special title, by the way. I think if you ask all the disciples, they would tell you, I'm the one that Jesus loved. Peter would say, I'm the disciple who Jesus loved. And Thomas would say, I'm the one who Jesus loved. And Andrew would say, I'm the one who Jesus loved. Because I, I would say this something about him. I think Jesus was that kind of person that when you walked into the room, you felt like he, you were the only one there. You felt like he, when he talked, he was just talking directly to you. And I think all of his disciples felt that way, by the way. 
But it tells us something about his love. His love is personal and intimate. This is not about Jesus' love in the broadest sense. Don't get me wrong, we, we rejoice. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. We know that he loves everyone. But this is more personal. He's saying that this is a specific person that Jesus has invested in. This is one family who Jesus cared about so much that when he heard that Lazarus was dead, he decided not to go. That, isn't that strike you strange? If you called me up tomorrow and you said, Cliff is a good friend of mine. I, I tease the hound out of Cliff, but I, I want you to know, Cliff and I, we've been working together for 17 years. Um, he's like, um, he's like a, a strange little brother to me, okay? All right? Y'all have an annoying little brother? That's Cliff. Now, I love him. If, so, if you called me tomorrow and said Cliff was sick or in the hospital or Cliff was about to die, I would immediately drop what I was doing, jump in my car, and run to be by his side. And I think he would do the same thing for me. I know he would do the same thing for me because I was in the hospital a number of years ago and, and, and I looked up and there was Cliff. By the way, <laughs> that may be not what you want to see when you wake up. You know, oh my, Cliff's here. Uh, and, oh, all right, so, but Jesus waits. He loved him so much that he waited. This is telling us something about God's timing. See, Jesus' love had a purpose. His love is not just general or vague. It's not some wishy-washy romantic idea. Jesus loves with a purpose. And he understands something that ultimately, rather than remedying the situation right away, he knows something bigger is going on. In fact, he, he tells us what that is. Notice in verse four, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Notice, it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He recognizes something that, that in this death, in Lazarus dying, Jesus is going to demonstrate something that is going to glorify the Father and point people to the Son so that they will glorify him. Y'all see that? Jesus is saying sometimes in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our difficulty, in the midst of our pain, God is doing something big. God has a purpose in it. He loves us enough uh, to, to wait and to delay. Now, we don't think of it that way, do we? When we're in pain, we want instant, immediate relief. And sometimes God says, no, it's not time yet. And that's what he does in this situation. And there's an application to that as believers. We need to learn to patiently wait on Jesus' timing in every situation. We need to wait on Jesus' timing. Just because he hasn't answered you yet, just because he hasn't done what you thought he was going to do, does not mean that he is not at work. You are praying about that illness and, and God hadn't taken it away from you yet. It's okay. God's got a plan. You, you've got a situation going on in your life that's some causing you pain, and you wonder, why hasn't God just freed me from that immediately? Well, maybe he's got a bigger plan going on. You need to know this. Not only is Jesus working in his timing, but listen to this. You need to know that his plans are always for his glory, and they'll eventually be darn good. See, here's the problem. We think that what God wants to do is always take us out of discomfort. That's not true. That's not biblical. There are very often moments where God allows us to go through challenging and difficult times, not because he hates us or he's mean to us, but because ultimately it is leading to his glory. That's why in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the Bible says that we know that though for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, we must wait on God's timing and trust that God's love uh, for his own is not, listen to this, it's not a pampering love. 
That means sometimes, you know, there are moments. I, I'm kind of famous for spoiling children. My own grandson, his little buddies, and his little friends. The other day, we were over here. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was the last Sunday night or if it was for good, uh, on, on uh, Thursday night when we had the Easter egg hunt. I was holding a uh, Hattie Ramage. Have you ever held Hattie Ramage? Hattie's only, what, a year old? And she is like a little, imagine a tin of biscuits that blew up. That's Hattie. She is just lovable and adorable and sweet. Hold her up back there so everybody can see her. All right, there she is, just the most adorable kid. And, and Hattie and I became friends because I will give her as much chocolate as she can eat. Okay? Now, I want to say this to you, and I dearly love Hattie. That's not really the best kind of love, to just pamper them. Love doesn't always tell you what you want to hear. It doesn't always do things just the way you think it needs to be done. I remember one time Sarah had a splinter in her finger, and I said, okay, bring it over here, and I'll take it out. Now, it is for her good that I take that splinter out, correct? You don't want it to get infected. You don't want it to create a bigger problem. And she holds her fingers out and, and I'm going to have to do something that's going to hurt for just a second. I'm going to have to hold her finger. I'm going to take a pair of tweezers. And I'm going to pull that out. And she didn't like that. She pulled it away. I'm not doing that out of hate. I'm doing that out of love. And because I love her, I'm not going to pamper her and just say, oh, it's okay let it go, because I know it's best to take that out. God's love is not a pampering love. God loved his son Jesus, but that did not mean that he did not have to go to the cross. Jesus' delay in going to Bethany to heal Lazarus does not indicate any lack of love on his part, but rather he waits and he moves at just the right moment to maximize the glory of God. So first thing I want you to know is God's love is never late. It's time to perfection. There's a second thing I want you to notice here. In John chapter 11, verses 17 through 16, true faith steps forward even in the midst of disappointment. Verse 7, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. So he waits two days, and now he says, it's time to go. Let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? They are raising an important point. If you go back to chapter 10, you'll discover something. Jesus had been over there in Judea near the area around Jerusalem, and he'd been ministering, and they ran him out. In fact, he is on the east side of the Jordan River hiding from the Jewish authorities when he gets this news. Now he says, okay, fellas, let's go back to Judea. He's like, let's go right back to where they're trying to arrest me. Let's go right back to where the trouble has begun. And they're saying, wait a minute. Stop and think about this. If you are the disciples, you know something about Jesus. Jesus does not have to be physically present with somebody to heal them. They know he can speak the word and they can heal them. They've seen that before. And they're saying, wait a minute, Jesus, they were just trying to kill you over there, and now you want us to go back? I think they were probably doing, sometimes when I'll say something to my grandson, Max, and he gives me this. I love it. He'll go, what? That's what the disciples are doing. What, Jesus, you, you want us to go back into the very place where we were just running from? Now, notice what Jesus does. Verse 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, I want to say sometimes Jesus, when he would respond to his disciples' questions, I think sometimes he left them baffled. I think this is one of those cases. They're like, Jesus, do you think it's a good idea for us to go back to Judea? And then he makes that statement in verses 9 and 10. And I think they must have wanted to go, okay, but should we go back to Judea? <laughs> he's not obfuscating things here. Actually, he's making a very interesting statement and an interesting point. What he's saying is, 
is that they've got to learn to work on God's schedule. They need to learn to walk in the light while the light is still there. They need to walk on God's schedule. When we walk in the light, we're basically following Jesus' timing and we're, fo- and, and we're trusting in his provisions and trusting the things. But then in verse 11, he adds something. And he makes a, a, a crucial statement. Look what he says. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Now the disciples, it says in verse 12, said to him, Lord, if he'd fallen asleep, he will recover. They're still thinking physically. They're still kind of not really hearing what Jesus is saying. Jesus uses a euphemism here. He's fallen asleep. And they're saying, well, if he just fell asleep, Jesus, he'll wake up eventually, you know. Then the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Now this next phrase, catch it. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Let us go to him. Now, Jesus had already given them a hint earlier what he was going to do. He had told them in verse number four, this illness does not lead to death. A better way maybe to translate that would, this this will not permanently lead to death. That's not going to be the final answer. That's not going to be the final statement here. That I'm going to do something miraculous. Now he says to his disciples, listen, Lazarus' death was really not so much about him, it's about you. So that you are going to come to faith. You are going to come to believe. Now, There's 12 of them standing there, but it's Thomas who makes the great statement. Now, Thomas gets a bad rap. What do we call Thomas? What's our nickname for Thomas? Doubting Thomas. Why? Because on the night after Jesus rose again, uh, Thomas says, I won't believe it till I see the wounds or touch the wounds in his hands and, and in his side, and Jesus appears. And, and, and that one moment in Thomas's life, have you ever been that guy? That in one moment, you did something goofy, and they labeled you with it forever. I, I, I think of, uh, we had a fellow here uh, that passed away last year named Jiggs Whalen. Jiggs was 102 years old when he died. They called him Jiggs for as long as anybody can remember Jiggs. I'll be very frank with you. I did not know what his real name was until I read his obituary. We called him Jigs from the time I was here. Do you know he got that name because when he was about six months old, an uncle said he looks like a character in a newspaper cartoon named Jigs. That was one statement a century ago, and we still called him Jigs. You all know, you get, you get the feeling? I mean, there's some people that, that are like that. You think about, um, we, we just label somebody, Doubting Thomas. But Thomas actually here makes an incredible statement. Look what he says in verse 16. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may, we may die with him. Thomas here is making a, a bold statement He's saying that in spite of the very obvious and very real danger, understand something, Thomas does not know what Jesus is going to do. He earnestly believes, and he has every reason to believe, by the way, that when they get to Judea, they will arrest Jesus and likely kill his disciples. Nevertheless, he says, I'm going to go. Even if it means dying, I'm going to follow Jesus. That is an incredible statement when you think about it. I want to just think about here for a moment the nature of true faith. Listen, true faith is not the absence of doubt or fear, but the courage to move forward in spite of it. Understand, Thomas does not know. He has no certainty about what's going to happen if he follows Jesus. In fact, he believes that it will probably turn out rather bad for him. And yet, he steps out on faith. He, he captures that and moves forward in it. 
We see that in the Bible sometimes. Gideon's a great example of that from the Old Testament. Gideon is scared. I had a seminary professor that used to call uh, 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 Gideon uh, God's scaredy cat. All right, he called him a super chicken one time. Gideon's not a brave guy. When, when he hears the Midianites coming, he's hiding from them. Even when God tells him what he's gonna do, he, he questions it and he wonders. And yet, Gideon goes down in the book of Judges as one of the judges of Israel. Why? Because he captured, even though he was afraid, even though he wasn't sure what the outcome was gonna be, he still stepped forward on faith. Ananias is like that in the book of Acts. God says, I want you to go and meet Saul of Tarsus. And he's like, God, uh, you know Saul's killing disciples, right? You know, you know he's killing Christians, right? Do you think he was afraid the day that he laid eyes on Saul of Tarsus? Yes, but he stepped out on faith. See, listen to me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a definition. I want you to hear this for a moment and follow me just for a moment. True faith is not grounded in the certainty of the outcome, but in devotion to Jesus. Now, I understand that we have many things that we are certain of as Christians. I just shared with you one a few moments ago. Because of my dad's faith in Christ, and because I believe that that, that, that was a genuine transformation because I saw the change, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, he's in heaven. I believe that. I know that when I die, I'll go to heaven. There's certain things. But there are some times where God tells us to do something and he doesn't tell us what the end result's going to be. Abraham, go leave Ur the Chaldees. I'm going to do all of these things. He had no idea of the difficulties and the challenges that would be in between there. In fact, the, the book of Hebrews says he died without seeing all the fulfillment of those promises. It's not about trusting the end result, but rather trusting the one who's called you. Our life is to be wholly and completely dedicated to Jesus. We don't know where that might lead. We don't know where that might take us. See, that's the problem sometimes as believers. We want, we want God to tell us all of the things that will happen. Well, God, if I, if I say yes to you're calling me to serve in this area in the church, what will you, how will that work out? He don't tell you all that. If he would have told me 30 years ago when he called me, to, oh, longer than that now, 40 some years ago when he called me to preach, that I would be moving away from everybody I knew and coming to Southern Illinois. But I, I gotta be honest with you. I didn't know the Ohio River ran past Southern Illinois. I found that out 17 years ago. Yes, I failed high school geography. All right? I didn't know it bordered on Kentucky. And yet God called me there. I didn't know that at the beginning. You have to be willing to say Yes, true faith obeys Jesus, not because he always gives us the desired outcome, but because he is our savior. It's not just about getting good things from him. It's about following someone that loved you so much that he died in your place. He's worthy of following even if it means death. That's what Thomas is saying. He's Jesus. Guys, do you know who he is? He's the Messiah. If he wants to go to Jerusalem and die, I'm in. That's what Thomas is saying. In the moments of our, our, our disappointment, step out in faith. Trust Jesus. Whatever you're going through in your life now, whatever the struggle, whatever the trial, trust him. Say yes to him. So God's love is never late. It's always time to preparation. True faith steps forward even in the midst of disappointment. But third, our hope is focused on the future but lived out in the present. You hear that? Our hope is focused on the future. Amen? We are looking for, man, things get crazy in the middle of life. Things get difficult in the middle of life, but our focus, we keep looking out and we're like, man, I know who's in control. I know what's coming down the pike. I know that there's something good. I know that he's gonna work it all out. Our hope is focused on the future, but it's lived out in the present. Look what happens in John chapter 11, verse 17. 
Now, when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. That's an important fact. Now, this was not a biblical concept that the Jews believed, okay? So let me, let me explain that. This is not a biblical concept. You're not gonna find this. But the Jews in Jesus' day believed something. It wasn't in the Bible, but in their traditions and in all the rabbinic teaching, they believed that when a person died, their soul kind of hovered about the body and remained for three days looking for a way to get back in. I don't know. I've always pictured of this soul going, hmm, can I go in there? No, nope, can't go in there. I, I don't know what they thought the soul was doing, but it was just kind of milling around and it would try to get back in. After four days, there was no more hope. The person was dead. Uh, you can think about it like the, uh, the munchkin on the, uh, remember on the uh, uh, Wizard of Oz? He is not, I, I, I wrote it down here. Uh, he was not uh, just merely dead. He was really most sincerely dead. <laughs> they believe that. Now we know, by the way, that the Bible teaches something very different. That the moment you die, you're in the presence of God. But they didn't know that. And what the Bible is trying to indicate here by telling us this was the fourth day is that in their mindset, there was no more hope that he was coming back. That there was no more hope that he was going to experience any kind of resurrection. Now notice what happens. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews who had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now remember, Thomas is worried about these folks. It's the Jews over in Jerusalem that have been threatening Jesus. And now he's saying, because it's proximity, a lot of these people are milling over and they're talking and they're, they're there to help Mary and Martha through this crisis. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Now, some people have interpreted that to mean that Mary was upset or angry with Jesus. I don't believe that at all. I think Mary is simply being a good host she, her job is to sit there and, and be, with the, with, be with the mourners, be with the friends, be with the people who have come to be there. And she's just doing what anybody would normally do. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not have died. But she has some hope. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. I like that statement. Martha says, Jesus, I, if you would have been here, you could have done something. But you know what? I know that God will give you whatever you ask for. She's expressing there a glimmer of hope, a sincere faith. She doesn't express it real boldly or bluntly, but she has this idea that Jesus might still do something. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now she thinks he's talking about the future. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Let me stop here and tell you something. About it. That tells you that Martha's been reading her Bible. Most Jews in Jesus' day did not believe in the resurrection. You remember the Sadducees? The Sadducees are the largest Jewish sect, much larger than the Pharisees, much larger than any other of the Jewish sects. They did not believe that there was any resurrection in the Old Testament. In fact, the resurrection is only mentioned very briefly and very vaguely in the Old Testament. Most Jews in Jesus' day did not believe there would be any resurrection. But Martha had been reading her Bible, I think. Martha had been listening to Jesus. Martha had been listening to the Pharisees who on this point did get it right. And she's expressing a very strong belief that when we die, that's not the end. I know that when resurrection day comes, he'll be resurrected. And then Jesus makes the most important statement. That was all introduction. I'm now I'm ready to preach now. <laughs> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, yet, though he die, yet he shall live. Listen to what she's saying there. He, he's connecting two ideas. I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection here it is a reference to our future hope. It's looking forward and grounding our hope out in the future. Remember I told you, our hope is out there in the future. It's grounded out there in the future. We're looking forward in the Christian faith. He's reminding us that 
that death is not the end. And so he is looking and reminding us that he is the resurrection, that he has even eternity in his hand. When he is, you know the story, everybody, I have not hid the, the end of this story. Jesus is going to speak the words, Lazarus is going to arise and come up out of the tomb. When Jesus raises him, he is picturing something that's going to happen, listen, to all of us one of these days. When we take a body out there and we bury them out at Metropolis Gardens or, or at one of the other cemeteries around here, and we lay that body in there, we know that's just temporary, right? One of these days, when Jesus returns, those graves are going to open back up. Both the righteous and the unrighteous, the righteous uh, to eternal life, the unrighteous to judgment. He's reminding us that his death is giving practical proof of who Jesus is and a pledge that one of these days he's going to give us life. I have a friend of mine named Burl Boswell who was a missionary for many, many years. He's passed away now. And Burl used to tell us about some of his missionary escapades. They went all over South America preaching to tribes. Uh, they reached a, a cousin tribe to the tribe that had uh, Jim Elliott and his friends were trying to reach back in the 50s and were killed. Burl went to a cousin tribe of those. And he tells me all the time about all these amazing moments where he thought he could die. And I used to love, Burl, how do you do that? You're going out in places where you know they're going to try to kill you. If they catch you, they're going to kill you. And, and he told me about nights they, were, they would try to kill him and arrest him and do all kinds of things. And, and Burl used to say, well, pastor, what do I got to lose? If they kill me, I'm with Jesus. Isn't that what they say in the New Testament? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen? He's reminding us of a future hope. But Jesus is also says, I am the life. There he's talking about, he is our present help. I'm the resurrection. I'm what you're looking forward to in the future. By the way, in 1 John, Jesus says, or John says it this way. He says, when we experience the resurrection, we don't know what we'll be like, but we'll be like Jesus. We're going to be made into the glorious image of Jesus. You remember we used to sing this song when I was a kid. He's still working on me. That's true. From the moment of my salvation till the time of my death, Jesus has been working on me. And one of these days when he comes back and we experience the resurrection, he is going to finally bring to completion what he started in eternity past. He's going to finally bring to completion what he, what he started and working on in my salvation. He's going to make me into his very image. And he's going to make you, if you're saved, into his very image. That's good news, is it not? Amen? We're going to lose all this stuff. But in the present, Jesus doesn't just say, well, give your life to me, and then, uh, well, I'll see you when I get back. That's not what he says. He tells us that he is going to be our life. We baptized two people this morning. That's a beautiful picture. It is a beautiful picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But it also tells you something else. I don't know where Grant's, I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see anybody, all right? Uh, it's easier to preach to you when I don't see your reactions, all right? Wherever Grant's at, wherever uh, uh, the other young lady is, when we baptized you, we were symbolized something. The moment that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, your old self died, and you were raised to walk in a newness of life. You are raised now to walk in Jesus. In fact, the moment that you gave your life, he took up residence in your life through the Holy Spirit. He now lives in you through this Holy Spirit and is guiding you and directing you and giving you a new life in a, in a new purpose. That's why in, in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Do you hear what he says? He says, the moment I gave my life to Jesus... My old self had died. Now I'm a new person. That's a glorious truth. And when Jesus says, I am the life, that's what he's talking about. We looked at that last week in here. Remember in John chapter 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the fault. Same idea. That he is now living his life out through us. Two things that you need to know about that. Number one. Jesus is our insurance of our future. 
but he is also the central focus of our life right now. You know what your, you, you know what your greatest purpose is? I know a lot of people who get to the end of, the li- of their life and they wonder, what was it all for? I, I'm gonna tell you right now. You exist and you live for the glory of God. And what Jesus wants to do is live his life out through you for the glory of God. That's what he wants to do. He is the resurrection and the life. So think about this. God's love is never late. He always moves at exactly the right time. It's time to absolute perfection. True faith steps forward even in the midst of disappointment, even when it means we don't understand what God is doing, we simply trust him. I can remember a number of years ago. And for those of you that are part of our church and been here for a long time, this will be very, this will be very meaningful to you. I can remember when Brother Brinker got sick. Boy, that, I'll be honest with you, that came out of nowhere. Brinker had retired, he was here. He was working with our senior adults. He, he was helping me uh, with all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, he's sick. And you realize when you hear the doctor's report, this is not good. This is terminal. And I remember sitting with Brother Brinker one day at the hospital, and he said to me, I always knew, so I, I'm, not, I'm not quoting him, this is the paraphrase. I always knew this day was coming. I just didn't know it was now. I just didn't know it was now. I remember he sat and he said to me, before I die, I want to preach one more time at First Baptist. I want to preach one more time at First Baptist. And he started working on the sermon. He never got to preach that sermon physically, but he has preached it every time we gather in this sanctuary, amen? Because of his faithfulness and and the foundations he laid, we continue to do the work that we do. I'm not trying to raise him above Jesus or anything, but I'm just telling you that there was hope there. It was disappointment. We didn't want it to be the end. We wanted many more years, but God said, you know what, it's okay. But you step out on faith. You keep trusting Jesus. You keep believing in him. You keep moving forward. Our hope is focused on the future, but it's lived out in the presence. Here's what we struggle with sometimes as Christians. This is maybe perhaps the greatest weakness in the church in the United States, the evangelical church in the United States. Very often we've gotten this idea, I've gotten my fire insurance, I'm going to heaven when I die, let me sit down and just watch everybody else minister and serve. We've even developed a doctrine of that. You're called to the ministry if you're a pastor or you're a deacon or you're a Sunday school teacher. Let me say this to you. All of us are called. You're called to the ministry. It may be different. My ministry is to preach the word. Be honest with you, I can't do much of anything else. They found out here a few weeks ago, we were stuffing eggs. They found out I'm too dumb to even stuff eggs. Me and Bob Bryant were sitting back there trying to put two egg bottoms together. I don't know. It's got to work together. Let me see if a blue one will work on an orange one. Let me see if a yellow one will work on a pink one. And we were doing it. Finally, Rosie Hannon said, there's a top and a bottom. But he's called me to preach. He's called you to do something else. I watch some of these guys do something. I watch the things that Adrian does with music and and administration, the things that he does uh, with his side of the ministry. And I'm amazed. I'm amazed even with Cliff. I'm amazed at, at the way that he can counsel and do things. God's made everyone. He's called you. Your life is, your hope is in the future. But listen, it's lived out right now. So start living. We come here today to celebrate the single most important moment in human history. Everything we believe as Christians rests on one single event, the resurrection of Jesus. 
Everything else falls in the line the moment we believe he is really risen. Because if he's risen, that means he died and his death was really what, it, what he claimed it was. Jesus said that his death was in our place. When Jesus came, he didn't die in just a general sense of the demonstration of God's love. He died specifically to pay your debt, my debt, every single person's debt. And the way we know that God the Father accepted that is Jesus rose again. Everything else he taught is, is, is proven by the fact, because here's the deal. If he didn't rise again, he was a fake. If he didn't rise again, he's just a liar. But if he rose again, he genuinely is Lord. And we have to decide, what are we going to do? The Bible, let me say this to you very simply. We like to say we're gonna give an invitation. The Bible actually doesn't give us an invitation. It gives us a command. Jesus says, follow me. And you are either obedient to it or you're disobedient to it. I love the fact that these folks came this morning and said, I follow in Jesus Christ. And I want to tell, tell, demonstrate that and tell the whole world about my faith. That's what it is. It's just obedience. I'm turning away from my old way of life. I, that's called repent. And then I'm putting my trust in him. He's calling us today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your life, there's never been a moment in your life where you've turned from your sin and you've trusted him. You're lost. If you died today, you'll spend eternity separated from him. But today, you can have life. Because he rose, you can have life. You can have hope for the future. Would you respond to him? You say, how do I do it? Well, it's not saying magic words. It's believing them in your heart. It's trusting him. It's trusting that he is truly the son of God, that he died in your place, that he rose again. To be willing to turn away from your sin. Well, I did that when I was a kid. I can remember kneeling beside my bed and I simply prayed a prayer that was something like this. I said, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that if I died today, I'd spend eternity separated from you. I know that, that the way I've been living in the way that you want me to live, and, and, and Lord, I know you don't have any reason to love me because of the way I've acted. But I believe that your son, Jesus, came, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for me. He rose again. And Lord Jesus, here's my life. Here's my life. Do with it what you can, basically. Here it is. Everything else has happened since is just a testimony to Jesus working. Amen? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to invite you to come to know him today.